here. We're going to make him a coast. So can I stop your screen share? Yeah, I can. Never mind. Oh, wait. You might need to stop your screen share. I don't see. It just lets me screen I can, share. Oh, I can end go. his. Boom. Perfect. You're seeing your new host. Boom. How are you, my friend? Doing well? I'm good. I'm good, brother. How are you? Excellent. 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 Let's uh, kick him out of here. Move spotlight. There we go. Now it's all you. Beautiful. All right. Let's get it done. Uh, are you going to be taking some questions, I think? Yeah, right. If you get done. Yeah. There. So it'll be 45 minutes with a... In I'm told that you were going to give me like a little noise notification to let me know when I'm when I hit my mark. Sure. And then it'll be 15 minute Q and A. Sounds good. And you are good to go. All right. Thank you. All right. So this is the lost history of ether physics: an introduction to toroidal field geometry. So before we begin, I want to give a special thanks to the boys over at the ADL Discord server. You're all a bunch of legends. Shout out to Jaronism uh, for his community building and putting together the show Cornerism. It was a it was a huge jumping off point for me to to go on there and, and start public speaking in front of people and um it really helped yeah get over that anxiety and, and stuff and a lot of gravy came out of that came out of that show so thank you so much for putting that on and a big thanks to Bob Nodell for putting together Globusters and not not shying away from um from the hard questions and and figuring out science and the truth and really really uh living uh that living the philosophy that the truth doesn't fear investigation um so thanks to you know shout out to bob uh peace be upon him shout out to jaron and austin for hosting this awesome event and bringing everyone together um you know more on that community building you thank you guys you're awesome you're legends um so with that said let's look at the historicity of the of uh of vortexes versus atoms so we have vortices in the atomic theory so we're all told about the atomic theory uh, most of the time, and we're not really told about the vortex theory. So we're going to learn about that. We're going to learn about the ether, and we're going to learn about how uh, vortexes form naturally in nature. So the vortex is the natural geometric expression of pressure mediation, and we're going to find this in all forms of nature, up to it, including large weather systems and the hum the down to the down to the human heart. So all the way uh, from the big to the small of vortices all the way down as a great man once may or may not have said. So here we are with uh, an excerpt from J.J. Thompson in 1883 on the treaties of, uh, of motion of vortex rings. So this is a presentation that he was giving at the Royal Society on, on, vort on the vortex theory that he was working on. Uh, in, in, in at the same time, <clears throat> uh, atomic theory was, was coming around. So what he was putting forward with vortex theory was um, that everything was started from a vortex, essentially, right? So we'll get into um, we'll get into this excerpt here, and I'll kind of explain what it means. So it will be seen that this that the work is almost entirely kinematical. We start with the fact that the vortex ring always consists of the same uh, particle, or the, <laughs> consists of the same particles of fluid. A proof of which, however, requires dynamical consideration, and the fact. And, and we find that the rest of the work is kinematical as well. This is further evidence that the vortex theory of matter is, is a much more fundamental character than the ordinary solid particle theory, since mutual action of the vortex rings can be found by kinematical principles, whilst the clash of the atoms in the ordinary theory introduces us to forces which themselves demand a, a, an additional theory to explain. So what he's saying here is basically um, physics is broken down into two uh, main parts. Kinematics and dynamics. Kinematics is measurements. You're not concerned with uh, the why or what uh, is, is causing the phenomenon. You're just making measurements. For dynamics, you're making predictions uh, using the uh, using the using like actual laws of physics based off of those measurements, right? So you're trying to see if if the if what you're if the hypothesis of why you think the the motion is happening. Um, you know, holds true, then you start to do your dynamic predictions, right? So what he's saying here is for the kinematic principles. You don't have to make any additional assumptions to supplement what you're even measuring. So it's it's a so it's a crazy. It would be a crazy violation to adopt a kinematic uh, theory that acquired that also required additional 
supplemental theories to even uh, give it consideration, which is like, you know, which is crazy. Some would say that's crazy, right? So that's kind of what he's saying there. And that's the basis of this. And this is why he was working so hard on it. And he did end up developing uh, the big limitation here with vortex theory versus atomism was the mathematics wasn't sufficiently developed to, um, to, to dynamically describe the motion of a vortex. And it was way easier to model things out as a particle. So we're going to go through the history of all that and we'll see uh, you know, exactly what all that means, right? So we'll start off with Antoni Henry Becquerel. This is a Frenchman from 1896, and he did some experiments with radiation. And what he did was uh, he took a, took a radioactive material and he separated a photographic plate in, um, using, a, using another material. And what he found is that the radioactive uh, waves were propagating through the material and activating the photographic plate. So this was this was pretty crazy because this meant that you know there was some invisible thing interacting, um, and they had to like come up with a way to explain that. So they did a lot of experimentation when they discovered you know, radio or radiation, and that led to uh, oh, one second. Okay, yep. So uh, that led to um, let's see what year was this? I don't have the year. Um, this was shortly after the uh, the 1896, but anyway. They did the they uh, they had a lead cavity here and they put uranium in it and the uh, so <laughs> the uranium they found from their experimentation that was it was blocking the uh, the radiation waves so you could direct the flow of radiation using lead so they came up with a lead cavity here they put uranium in it and they had a direct uh, flow here and then they used uh, two ch two charged plates uh, to put a current between them electric current. So that the so that the radiation was going through the uh, through the current, and then they found that on the end there with a photographic plate, they found that the plate was being activated at different at different areas rather than just straight through. They found that there was an effect, so they found that it wasn't just emitting one type of radiation. They found that there was multiple types of radiation. So the there was um, this green one here would be what they call gamma radiation, and this is neutrally charged. So it's not affected by the positive or negative current flow within this field here when this when these plates are charged. And they found that there was a deflection towards the positive, and they called this beta uh, radiation. Uh, so this this deflects up towards the positive because it's low pressure, or I mean, uh, low energy. And then there was alpha radiation, which deflects slightly towards the negative, so it's a higher energy than the uh, than the gamma radiation. So that's how they came up with. Uh, with their understanding that this was that, that there was a you know something going on here at a smaller scale that they didn't really know how to interpret, and then it, when it when it comes down to mathematics, it was way easier to describe this whole interaction by saying that th that this type of radiation that this gamma particle is actually a charged particle with mass, and based on its mass and its interaction with the electric field, it deflects based off of its off of its mass relationship. So when they get into establishing the charge mass uh, relationship and saying that energy equals mass and all that kind of stuff, that's the reification so that they could get into the mathematics to describe it way easier. Um, because once you have the mass, you can get the uh, you have the velocity, so you get the you get the moment, you get momentum out of that, and from that you can describe the whole thing as a, as a, as a physical particle. You can get spin, rotation, all this crazy stuff, and, and attribute. Uh, physical properties to it through mathematics that don't even exist in the way that um, that that have any physical meaning or relation to reality. So, so that's the uh, that's the experiment with that. So, um, on with that energy mass relationship situation. In 1904, there was a guy named Hassel Norrell who did an experiment with a closed hollow sphere, and when he when he uh, he did it up with radiation, he found that. Um, it increased the weight of it, and until the until the heat dissipated from it from the sphere, the weight didn't uh, you know would return down to normal. So he came up with a coefficient to express this, and this was an early rendition of uh, energy or uh, mass energy equivalence, right? Because we're all familiar with Einstein's E equals m c squared, and it's all it's it's typically attributed to him um, through the relativistic confines, but that's uh, you know neither here nor there, but. This is the uh, this was like what was going on beforehand, right? It was 1905 is when uh, he came out with E equals MT squared. So this is just other people expressing this relationship through their experimentation. All right, so we're so we're gonna take it back a little further um, to the 
to eight to the, to the late 1800s now, and we're going to get into the atomic model and the free electron theory for how they explain uh, electricity and pressure mediation on the small scale with their particle interactions. So J.J. Thompson in 1897 did a cathode ray experiment with a with a with what's called a cathode tube, and we'll get into that in the next slide. But the big thing that he was famous that he's um, that came out of this experiment was this coefficient right here, one fifth times c squared over mu times a, and and we'll get into what all that is. So that's basically um, the would that be that would be like the the foundational baseline for the establishment of the atomic theory for when they get into um, uh, the mass of everything and the interactions of it because it's all based off of the calibration of the electron. So we're going to really analyze the history of the electron before we move on to the, the vortex theory. Because remember, the two competing theories were a vortexual interaction and a little tiny particle that may or may not have other little tiny particles inside of it to facilitate a, uh, a, a pressure exchange or pressure mediation through, uh, through charge potential as little tiny particles. So we'll see, um, we'll see where they may or may not have went wrong here. So check the notes here. One second to zoom things in the way. There we go. All right. So calculated the relationship. Okay. All right. So we'll get into the experiment here. So JJ Thompson had a cathode tube. And what this is, is this is just a glass tube here. And he has an anode and a cathode on the inside. And behind the anode, he has a grounded disc here with a little slit in it. And on the other, and then midway through the tube, there's an electric, um, there's electric plates and there's also magnets here. So he can do north-south magnetic field manipulation and also electric, electric uh, current flow manipulation. And using that, he can uh, also, the, uh, the tube is filled with a filament that will interact with the, with the energy of the electron um, as, it, as it comes through the tube and it'll create a beam. So when he, when you interact or when you put that beam through the fields, it will, uh, you know, diverge or converge uh, corresponding to its charge potential. And at the other end of the tube, they have a scale here and they, and that's where they're measuring the divergence of the, of the beam based on how much charge uh, they're putting into the fields. Right. Um, so when you, when you connect copper wires to this, to the anode and cathode, uh, yeah, that's this... the old Cliff, a friend of. Um, yeah, um, someone, someone's talking. I can. No, hear uh, yes, yeah, we can just. Throw... Um, sorry about that. I don't know if somebody has your microphone. Yep, you're straight. Let's see here. So when you hook up the when you hook up a current to this, and it's you know it's charging up right here. There's a the grounded plate behind it behind the high potential. So there's a flow here that's uh that's. That's directed through that little slit that's cut through the grounded, so it creates a coherent direction of, of pressure uh, mediation to flow through this tube, and that's what creates the beam when it's interacting with the filament. And then when they uh, apply a current to the plates or use the magnets, they they're de they're deflecting it, and they're basically um, what they what they need to do is is describe this interaction mathematically. And again, the vortex theory um, hadn't been sufficiently developed mathematically yet, um, so. So they went with particle theory, and the way that they did that here is with the, is with uh, J. J. Thompson's coefficient. So what we what we looked at earlier, oops, what we looked at earlier with this one fifth times e squared over mu times a, is e is the electric charge which they could measure. So they know how much they're putting into the into the system for it to register. So what my interpretation of the electron is, it's not a charged particle. It's the lowest amount of energy that they can put into a system for their um, for their instrumentation to register an event and like you know. Uh, register it basically so they can do stuff with it so that's the lowest possible amount so they have that and then they assume a which is the radius of a of a sphere so they have a charge so they're going to going to interpret this through the lens of a charged particle so they need to make it a sphere so they have a which is the assumed radius of the charged particle and then they have the one fifth which is their which is the coefficient to distribute the energy over the radius of that of that sphere so once they have all that they can describe this interaction as a ballistic trajectory from as a from a particle, and then they can get momentum. They can start applying all their other um, uh, uh, calculations to it through like Newtonian um, laws of motion and all that kind of stuff. So they can they can start analyzing it through that lens, and that was really favorable because it led to a lot of um, predictions. Because based based off of this a simple uh, experiment here, I mean, it it you would. You, 
you could see like there would be a natural interpretation like okay yeah it is sure because you could use that math to describe the interaction flawlessly now as things progressed they found that there were holes in that model and it you know completely fell apart but at the time they were like okay you know bet <laughs> let's just run this so we're going to analyze this interaction a little further here and we're going to break down um, the experiment a little more so if we if you break down the periodic table for between uh if you break down everything that's a metal and a non-metal and you say that non-metals are conductors or they're dielectric materials or insulators. And then you say that metals are conductors, so they direct the current flow. And the insulators, um, you know, they, they, uh, they store the energy, right? So for, the free, so for free electron theory, how they explain um, capacitors and all this stuff in the interaction with, uh, with, the, with the cathode beam, what, what, they would, what they say here, is that say you have a battery, you connect an anode and cathode, so two, two charge plates, and they're, they're distributing their charge potential, right? Um, they're saying that, that these little charge particles, that there's like a leftover spillage of them, and those stay on the plates, and, those, and that's where the charge is stored, right? But what actually happens is um, they found that if you add a dielectric material between these two plates, you can store way more charge, uh, like to, to an insane degree, and use that later. So, uh, and that's, and that's reaff sorry. So, um, so let's see. So that's, um, that's, that's really bad for their model because they, they completely hinge on the interaction of it being within, within the metal. And in the 1700s, Benjamin Franklin made the dissectable Leiden jar, which is basically two metal surfaces. So an anode and a cathode and the dielectric material here is a glass jar in between with some, with a, uh, liquid in it. And and foil, and basically this will store charge potential in it, and you could swap out these these uh, the anode and cathodes with with different um, with different metals that aren't even charged. You know, you can discharge them, make sure they're not carrying any charge, set them up, and then this this glass will discharge. So the the entire model of the free electron and how they explain electricity hinges on everything being um, stored in in the in the metal plates, and that's not that's that's not the case. So my, the, the etheric vortexual pressure mediation explanation of this experiment would be in this, in this uh, cathode ray or tube, or I'm sorry, in this cathode tube, the charge potential is building up here. There's a high to low situation going on here with the grounded. It's creating the coherent beam flow for the pressure mediation within the tube. You have two fields which are introducing, uh, you know, resistance or impedance within the, within the medium of the dielectric material, which is the glass tube. And that's that's changing the the current flow. So you're literally just watching pressure mediation change its direction of current flow uh, as it as it's going through the tube. And at the time, like I said, it was easier for them to to describe that mathematically um, as a ballistic trajectory situation with charged particles, but which, which of course uh, required additional supplemental reification theories, which is the strong nuclear force and the weak nuclear force, where they say that that there's um, that there's little tiny Particles called gluons and charmed gluons, and and they change into leptons, and there's a and they get all the way down to calling it uh, color pressure mediation between particles, where um, where the, where these little gluons and leptons are carrying charge potential between the between the uh, uh, the nucleus of the atom and all that. It, it's it's so insane. Like it requires that that much more of it, and those things have never been found. Those just mathematically have to exist to reify the kinematic description of it as a particle. So now that we've now that we've learned what how the cathode uh, tube works, we can begin to analyze how CERN works because that's exactly they've never stopped doing the cathode experiment. So this is exactly the same as this. Um, so they have they have a place where they have a coherent uh, beam to you know facilitate pressure mediation. They store up charge potential in dielectric material. Then they discharge it in the same, you know, in a in a focused location, and then they just analyze that interaction. They they analyze that ripple. So I'll read a little bit from the um, uh, from the Fermi Lab um, website here, where they did the muon G two experiment. Now the muon they say is a you know comes into existence through relativistic effects, blah blah blah. Um, but it basically what this is, it's just like a little burst of energy that they don't really know how to account for because they've already account they've already committed an entire model to um, uh, 
based off of everything off of off of the uh, off of the electron, right? So they have they have an even smaller amount of energy now that pops in and out of existence. They can't really measure it for a long period of time. So they um so they have like a different kind of classification for it. They describe it slightly differently. So so this is what they say how they talk about what a muon is, what this energy that they're registering with their machines is. They say the muon G minus two uses the Fermi Labs powerful accelerator to explore the interactions of short-lived particles known as muons with a with a strong magnetic field and empty space. Scientists know even a vacuum that even in a vacuum, space is never empty. Instead, it is filled with invisible with an invisible sea of particles that is in accordance with the laws of quantum mechanics pop in and out of existence for an incredibly short amount of time. Scientists can test the presence and nature of these virtual particles with a particle beam traveling in a magnet. The, the muon minus two experiment, or G minus two experiment, examines the precession of muons that are, that are subjected to a magnetic field. The main goal is to test the standard model's predictions of the valued measure of the precession of rapid blah, 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 right? So to, with, a, with an extremely small amount of time, so they got this down to uh, like fractions and fractions of a second, they're, re they're registering a, an extremely small amount of energy, one part in 14 million um, is what they're like, just like the most minuscule amount of energy. And they're attributing all this to, um, to it, that it comes out of a sea of particles that they, that they describe it as like, um, like, like there's a background field, but they, they're not, they don't know how to describe physical properties to it because they've built their whole a philosophy and worldview that this field has no physical properties and doesn't exist. But they're but they're perfectly comfortable describing it as abstract mathematics as a sea of virtual particles. So when you get into the the ether theory and vortexes and all that, um, these 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 same experiments that reify all these quantum effects and all this stuff were reexamined by Atsutovsky um, and some other people, and he put together a book where they come up with kinematic and dynamic models of the ether based off of the same experiments that reify the atomic model and quantum effects, right? So if you were to say, hey, what are the physical properties of the ether? Well, we have density, pressure, uh, we have how fast uh, waves can propagate through it. We have, we have all kinds of stuff that people have researched and just it's not talked about in mainstream because it completely contradicts their model uh, and has further implications beyond that, which, which we all know. Um, you know, they're not trying to address, right? So again, just on the kinematic viscosity of the ether. So basically what that means is uh, this guy took measurements at altitude using mountains and reflectors to change like the, to change the horizontal path of, uh, of propagation so that he could measure, like is he faster when it's propagating horizontally at altitude, essentially? And what he found was, yes, it does. So if we, rem if we recall back to, um, the thanks Bob experiment where the gyroscope registers at altitude, you know, that, that data is still being an, analyzed right now. Maybe, m maybe it did, maybe it didn't, but we have reproductions of Miller's work right now from other people to that substantiate that same claim with measurements where the, uh, where it, in, where the speed increases with altitude. So it's definitely showing that there's physical properties to an ether field and that propagation through it is, you know, increases with altitude due to these physical properties right here. So in terms of a physical model for where I think we live, I think we live in, in an ether field that's following uh, a tor the toroidal motion uh, and that, that vortex that it's creating is what's, being, is what's being measured. So at altitude, we get a lower reading. When we go up at altitude where the vortex is, or you know, where it's following that vortex, that's where you're getting uh, a faster reading. So, um, so the, we're all familiar with the block domain wall situation here. So that's kind of that's kind of what I'm putting forward. Instead of living on a sphere, we live in a sphere, right? And we live in this toroidal field pulsation situation, <laughs> pulsation situation, right? That's uh, that's something. So, so yeah, we we live on this this plane of inertia, right? This stationary plane. Uh, there's a high pressure potential above us. This creates that um, uh, that Gaussian surface where we have that static electric gradient that increases as you go up linearly up to like, uh, I forget the voltage at altitude, but it's insane. So we get sprites and elves at the top. So we have that super high potential and then the low potential at the ground following the right hand rule. We have a magnetic field, a, fl a fluctuation of flow that follows sidereal rotation. Um, you know, we, we literally have all the, we literally have all the mechanisms to live inside of the field that, you know, rather than we live on, 
the surface of something that's producing a field, a magnetic field inside of it through a rotating core that may or may not be attached to the the inner workings of the of this of the inner sphere, right? So it's all very uh, it's all very cool. So this is just kind of a uh, a, a picture of of uh, just a side angle view of what that would look like again. So this red line would just represent that block domain wall, that plane of inertia. This inner toroidal donut would would represent our northern hemisphere. This would represent all of the, like everything that comes from the um, all, all of the readings and, and maps and everything is all based off of the northern hemisphere. So what's going on in this central donut here is what is of, 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 of is of of primary importance because this donut can only be so big, right? But this outer donut can be you know quite bigger. So if you were going to make a system and confine people to a certain area within this donut, you know, you would have to make things uh, seem to match up proportionally. So that's kind of what I think they've done with the mapping of the stars and stuff. And we'll get into uh, toroidal field optics and all that as as we as we move on. Uh, Jaron, how am I at on time? Uh, so we have an yeah, ether flow model time. here. What's that? Plenty of time. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So we have um, we have here the a toroidal flow model. Uh, shout out to I can science that who made this model. Now he disclaimer he's not an uh, an ether believer or a flat earther. He just made this uh, generously to to conceptually see if it would work as a thought experiment, and it turned out that it did. So if you take the globular single axis gyroscope readings that they say that you would have to correct the orientation of the gyroscope to be in line with the axis of rotation of the Earth, well my 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 counterclaim is is that it's measuring the ether flow, obviously, and to align it with the sky or the flow of direction of the ether, you would have to make the same correction angles. All the publicly available data I could find on single axis gyros were in the northern hemisphere that were basically equivalent, that, and they were all they were all around the 45th latitude, so they were all equivalent to making planar correction angles to Polaris. So there's no way to really distinguish. Um, between a, a plane or a globe in regards to those correction angles. Um, and then the readings, of course, are just measurements, so there's no way to distinguish if the Earth's rotating or if the sky's rotating, and if there's an ether field that's, you know, dragging that, uh, or causing that uh, that light to propagate differently, right, corresponding with that rotation. So that there's they're kinematically equivalent in that regard. So, um, so, like, a big distinction would be explaining the correction angle due to the due to the earth being a, a globe right so but again if we're if the ether flow is following toroidal geometry all the correction angles on a plane match up uh perfectly so this is uh this is a representation of that um the in the in the blue here i think is the east west flow and then the green is the west east flow so the toroidal field it, it reverses on the outer side so it, it so it this is really cool because it really it literally absorbs uh current technology one-to-one -one with a flat earth. So that's awesome. Uh, so here's a conceptual model of what that vortex flow would look like just to give a, a, a better rendition of it. So we got the, the donut situation here, the gyroscope correction angles, and it's all flowing, um, you know, it, it, it's all it's all flowing in the way that that the technology that utilizes it works. So if it's not this, then you know, <laughs> got a problem. All right. Cool. So that's um. So that's um. That's the ether flow model on a flat Earth for mapping to mapping toroidal geometry. All right, so we're going to get into perturbations in the ether to kind of give a visual representation of what that would look like. So we're all we all hear the term perturbation in the ether, disturbance in the ether. We're like, what's perturbating? What does that mean? So if we look at this blue line, this blue stream here, let's say that that's the ether background, right? And like, obviously, this isn't the scale or anything, but this is just you know, so we can see it. So obviously, the whole flow, the whole the whole water, the whole tube filled with water is the ether. But this, we're focusing on this. Uh, Blue flow, that we, so that we could see the effects of what's going on. So, natural ether flow, nothing going on here, and then you start introducing uh, stress and, and um, tension on the ether, right? Start that perturbation. Well, it's, it starts building up effects, right? And as that starts happening, that's the that's the effect you're getting. So when they turn the electron, or when they, when they're generating their electrons and all that stuff, this is what is happening, right? There's an excitation in the medium that's building up. When there's charge potential building up, 
this is a vortex forming. This is little vortexes becoming a bigger vortex, you know, until it reaches its maximum potential. When we talk about a change in the modality of the ether, this is that modality change. Now, when this vortex collapses due to you turn the power off, uh, you know, and, and, and entropy ensues or what have you, the vortexes will start to split and make little tiny vortexes, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So when you see those um, energy change fluctuations happen and you get different effects uh, in reality, that's due, that's all from this pressure mediation build up with the with the vortexual motion. So so when you so when you think uh oscillations in the vortex medium and all that and and particles or a sea of virtual particles, right? This would be uh this would be that. All right. All right. So we have um so for the atomic model to kind of to kind of replace that when they when they analyze things on a really small scale and they get their get their pictures and stuff, they see like gaps in the field and they attribute this to like, oh, we have a cloud of probability. Maybe the electron exists in here, but if we find it, that would completely falsify everything, you know, due to the Heisenberg principle or uncertainty principle. But uh so so we can't really find it, but maybe it exists within like, within this shadow here. So this is uh, from the channel Physics Girl, where she takes a plate and moves it over the surface of a pool, and it creates two what what appears to be two vortexes that rotate across the surface of the pool, and they never collide or um, or uh, or separate. And she was wondering, uh, you know, why? Because they they should definitely do one of those things, right? Well, what she found when she added food coloring to it is that the vor that the vortex is actually one vortex, and it's co and it's connected. Now, because of the how she's looking at it through the pool and whatnot, you can only see, you know, one side of the interaction. But when she was in the pool, you could see a reflection of the bottom where it completed the whole interaction. So this completes a toroidal ring vortice. So this is what that inter this is what that action created. Like the pressure mediation from that motion in a medium literally created two or literally created a vortex ring. So this is what um this is what the, the perturbations are in the medium. This is what motion does uh, in the in the ether field. Um, so let's see here. Let's see, and this doesn't. So the, like like I said, so the reason these don't collide is because they're actually connected. But when they're looking at it on that small scale through the lens of their interpretation of it being little tiny particles, uh, you know, they interpret that gap as a field as like maybe maybe the maybe there's an even smaller thing in there carrying little smaller things. You know, so that could be the case, but who knows, right? So we have um, uh, your body creates a toroidal field. You're, the highest charge potential is in your head, and then down to the feet. So there's a there's a flow there. You have a right hand rule magnetic uh, toroidal field flow from your body, and in and in nature we have we're gonna an, we're gonna analyze a um, a storm system here building up. So for tornadoes, they were thinking like. They, they couldn't really uh, explain like the end justification for how the how the vortex like hits the ground and, and connects because it happens really quickly. There has to be certain conditions met, and they came up with a couple hypotheses hypotheses which were uh, falsified by real data. And what they found was that there's a little tiny the little tiny vortexes are forming simultaneously while the big vortex is forming above, and they at the same time they all collapse together to make one big. Uh, vortex. So we're going to watch that interaction through the data here real quick. Uh, Jaren, what's my time? Uh, 10 minutes if you want to stop at 45 after. Okay, perfect. Okay, so this dude was a proponent of little tiny vortexes of the theory that, or of the situation that I just laid out. So this dude was doing the research and going to the sites and collecting the data and all that. So we're going to listen to the analysis of his uh, of his data. Should we have sound? Oh, you know what? You should, but if you don't, no problem. I'll just narrate it. So what he's saying here is that um, they they were expecting to find little tiny vortices here when they analyzed the data, and what do you know? They were find they they found little tiny vortices. So this is them saying the data the data proves it, and they're zooming in on little tiny vortices, and then we're gonna and then we're gonna look at a model here of it of what they're saying happens on the ground. Yeah, my bad on the audio. So he's talking about the downdraft of it and how their their other theory was falsified about the air being squirted up. Uh, so there was no air squirting. It turns out just just little just more vortexes all the way down. All right. So did he show the graphic already? Yeah, he did. Okay, cool. So that's that. 
And what else we got? What's this? Not sure. Okay, so just an end note on that, or another graphic to end on that. So what they, what they did, what that guy discovered, and what they've you know put out now is that there's this little vor that there's a, another vortex ring is generated. It absorbs with the bigger vortex ring at this like simultaneously, right? So now we're going to listen to um, Dr. Tom Cohen talk about how the heart um, is a toroidal flow of of, of blood in your in your uh, in your body. But there's no audio, so we're actually not going to listen to that. My condolences. One second, let me see if I can share this because this was actually really cool. I want to. I'm going to see if I can get this in real quick. You should just be able to sh reshare and click the little box, yeah? Yep. Share with audio. Yep. Here we go. Thank you, Jaren. Okay. So, how does it work? Well, the other thing is the blood essentially stops at the tissue. A little level. quiet, but can you get it? Yeah, sorry about, yeah, sorry about that. Because it has to offload food and oxygen and pick up carbon dioxide and waste. And so you wouldn't need a pump when the blood is already moving the fastest at the entrance of the heart and the exit. You would need a pump where the blood is stopped at the tissues. So the pump has to be at the tissues and not at the heart. So what happens is because of, you know, Gerald Pollack did experiments with this. If you put a horizontal tube that's hydrophilic and you fill it with water, it creates a separation of charges and the positive charges go into the middle, they repel each other and start moving. And that process is actually enhanced by light, by UV light. So you shine the light on a living system, it structures the water in the capillaries, that creates a separation of charges and movement, and that goes faster and faster just because it's, it's you know, going from a wetland to a, ri a river, goes up to the heart, going fast, the heart is like a dam, fills up the chamber of the heart. And when the pressure in the, the incoming side is more than the pressure on the other side, there's a vacuum on the other side of the dam gate. The gate opens and it suctions in and the blood essentially is distributed through this vortex action in the heart to the rest of the body. And in the heart, it's not squeezing, it's vortexing. So like the Sufis say where, you know, the heart is stopped and there's a vortex, that's where the energy of the world or God comes into the heart through that vortex uh, created in the heart. And that's how it works. And then there's little vortices in there that distribute certain blood to different organs, which is fascinating. And that's how it works. And All right. Thanks, Tom. So, yeah, little tiny, little tiny vortices in your heart's a big vortice. Very cool. So. The big distinction there is like they tell us that the heart's pumping and all that stuff, but it's not. It's a vortexual pressure mediation um, interaction. And what he described further in the interview, because I just cut off the segment there for this clip, but what he describes further, he breaks it all down, like the mechanics of how they say the pressure buildup in the heart. It would never work the way that uh, that like in a, as a pump. So yeah, very, very awesome uh, talk there. I highly recommend uh, listening to it. I'll have a link available. Uh, at some point, somehow, I'll get it to get it to the people. So thanks, thanks for JT for sharing that with me. So we'll get into toroidal geometry too. So our eyes are actually we see in toroidal fields too. So we 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 see in what's modeled out as called the Vith Mueller circle. So if you take your left and right eye and you take you uh, take a circle that uh, intersects your eye perfectly, you wrap it in a sphere. Same with the other one. It creates a, a toroid with an inner and outer donut. The inner donut would be your near near field of vision which would be described as an ecliptic and the far field would be, um, you know, a hyperbolic uh, field. And what, when all that means is basically there's a different type of dynamic scaling for things that are at a distance, right? So if something, so if there, if there's a building between you and a mountain, the building is going to be taller than the mountain because the mountain's further away and all that. And this is the mechanism that facilitates that optical compression rate. So for everything to fit into your field of view, it can be modeled out that we see in toroids. And this was experimentally, you know, validated and, and and worked out in the in the 40s and 60s, um, through the work of Dr. Carl Rudolf Lundberg and uh, some some military experiments here. And what they're basically saying, the summation of this is they came up with a constant for the uh, for the curvature rate, and they said when they apply that uh, optically, 
uh, it's equivalent to uh, to the mathematics that they use to do Euclidean predictions. And this one's even better because the Euclidean predictions are off by like 30 degrees in modern measurements. So it's a uh, so we, we you could say that we even see in toroids here. So if we were to look at so if we were to look at the distribution of illumination of the sun over a Gleason's map, we had two observers here. The red and blue, or I mean red and green, we would have the green observer. The solid green line or the solid green circle would be his local field, like terrestrially, like looking horizontally. And then this green open circle would be his field of view of the sky, right? And you would see that over this distance here, there's a huge intersection with the um with an observer over here, right? So they can see large sections of the sky together. And basically um, an entire map was built map off of this tor toroidal geometry of our optics when applied to the sky. And that's how they came up with maps to navigate over the the uh, the plane of inertia that we live on that definitely uh, doesn't meet the geometry specifications that they say were terrestrial measurements without reifications. Uh, so, so yeah, if you just look at uh, sky optics, like even when you look through uh, Stellarium, this this uh, azimuthal grid of vision, this this toroidal geometry is expressed in the same way. And if you'll notice this, uh, these these converging and stretching map uh, matches an azimuthal projection map in the same regard. Um, you know, I wonder if there's a, any correlation to the mapping of the geometry of the sky to uh, to a map and trying to flatten it out. Uh, so. Um, so this azimuthal grid is also, also produces uh, sun dogs, moon dogs, and rainbows. So when you see those, this is the optical like limit of the vision or the, like your arc of vision. This is the representation of that when you when you see these effects in the sky. So here's a quick clip of celestial phenomenon in the sky mapped out um, with uh, or mapped out to curved visual space, and then when you apply um, refraction to it, I'm sorry, when you apply um, yeah, refraction to it, like, you know, regular optical effects, you get the exact same geometry in the sky that you see on the quote unquote, that's, that's supposed to be mutually exclusive, mutually exclusive to a globe. You see the exact same thing on a plane, now knowing that we see in toroids and that when you apply refraction to the sky, it, 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 like this is what we see. So here's a quick clip of that. So this is no refraction, and then when you add the atmospheric effects, it, it, it's what we see in the sky. So if we hypothetically, if we lived in a plane of inertia inside of a field and we were looking up at the sky and there was uh, celestial phenomenon happening in the sky, and we, this is what it would look like from our perspective. So that's cool. Um, here's, a, here's, another, here's some more eye candy for that. Uh, so like this inner... This inner sphere here, or um, yeah, this inner uh, grid here is your azimuthal grid. So celestial phenomenon happening in the, you know, in the within the toroidal field, but you're seeing, the, but this is how it's perceived to you on the ground. And if there was another observer here, you would see the same interaction, and you could, you know, build a map off of that. That's basically what was done in the 1700s. So it's cool, cool. All right. Uh, I'm open. You're at the uh, 15 minute mark. Yeah. Okay. Uh, awesome. Any questions? You can either raise your hand or maybe Caprice has some ready for you. Caprice? We don't have any in the chat yet, oh, but Chris has raised his hand. Okay. You can go ahead and unmute him. And I'll ask. Uh, <clears throat> I was wondering if you saw Austin's debate last night, what you thought of that? I ha I didn't get a chance to watch it yet. I watched a little bit of it. Go check that out. I think it's a, a good model for <clears throat> at least the Globers to realize that, you know, we, we're just open to conversations. Uh, and not being shouted at and, you know, <laughs> yeah, absolutely, bro. Makes for a good, good conversation when somebody just is okay with just sitting there and talking. Oh, let me fix the screen. I didn't know you're going to do that. Okay, good. You're good. So, so yeah, that, that debate was awesome. Um, and then Rob Parks, I believe, Alan, I did see on your channel, you're going to have him on pretty soon here as well. Yeah. Yep. That's great. Uh, I think you guys will have a really good conversation. Yeah. Jaron, um, like like you were saying that was amazing to see two people with differing views sit down and have a cordial conversation um without the shit flinging you know it's amazing it's amazing what two mature adults can do you know in a situation like that um instead of the shit show that we usually get with those types of debates right so um, the whole time we've been waiting all these years and it's we would be so much further along if it wasn't for being held back and and having to 
deal with those. If it was just people who wanted to have serious conversation about it, we would be much further along. Yeah, that 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 was awesome. Um, yeah, so so Alan, great presentation. That was that was incredibly um, informative and and some amazing info there. Definitely going to require a few rewatches just to absorb it all, man. But uh, you, you, as you were saying, you said that they've known about the fact that our optics are literally literally vortexual for what like over half a century now. They've known that. Yeah, so in the in the forties, like early forties, there was a guy named Dr. Carl Rudolf Lundberg who um, who came over here um, from from Germany, and he uh, he basically pioneered uh, merging the near field and far field with Maxwell's equations. And Max and what that means is Maxwell's equations describe the radial change of a of a toroid, right? So basically, the uh, the size of the toroid that we see in, like he by merging the equa- by merging optics with those equations. He basically said that the near field, um, you know, he described that as a toroid, an inner and outer donut relationship. And uh, yeah, he did a whole whole thing on that. And then that's been um, experimentally verified, like that document that I was reading with the Biff Mueller uh, Taurus field. That's from that's a, I think that's a military document where they were going over like the, val- the validity of that of optics and stuff. And even in in mainstream optics right now, it's like it's you know it's it's one of those things where it's debated, right? Where they're like, should we start describing things in hyperbolic geometry, or should we stick to the Euclidean predictions where the train tracks converge and they're not supposed to? Like, what do we do? We don't know. So, uh, and they really and they can't really do anything because if they did, then they would have to kind of re-examine uh, what was done in in the seventeen um, in, in 1777. Where they came, where they rolled out the lat long uh, coordinate system that they were going to uh, use to describe the globe, and and the corrections that were made uh, based off of you know two observers in different locations where they have an overlap of the sky and what correction angles would would be necessary um, to uh, to match that coordinate system that they were imposing on everything. Yeah, so so that kind of leads me into the the next part of that the question I was going to ask is so like over half a century they've had this info it's been confirmed through subsequent experiments. So did did everybody just forget to tell the uh, surveyors mm-hmm. that tend to use the their reified model the observations so, is yeah go ahead yeah so when you talk to the surveyors about it they 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 literally are like no like we don't account for that and we're like <laughs> they're like they're like we know like we're saying you should. And they're like, well, what equation should we use? And we're like, well, I don't know, man. Like, we don't we don't have like the exact equations, man. But it's like literally the effects that are measured in in experiments that they're not relating this field to, like the same effects that you're quote unquote measuring as as a dip angle for spherical excess and all that kind of or reciprocal zinnies and all that. Uh, it's like you know, there's definitely a relationship here, like, but they they're unwilling to uh, look at it or, or 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 you know apply it or figure it out. Yeah, it kind it of just, seems like it fits perfect with our model, but then they're left empty-handed after that. After that kind of slam dunk, there, huh? Yeah, well, it explains like the optical phenomenon we we see really well, and well, you know, completely, really, and uh, and it removes the, the the big thing is it removes the physicality of the curvature of the Earth, so like they really can't go back on it. Yeah, know? that's like, spher- it, that it, spherical excess just kind of kind of slips through their fingers at that point, huh? Dude, like, yeah, they they can't afford to give any of it. <laughs> they need all 39 59 of that radius bro anybody else uh have a question raise your hand we've got about 10 minutes or so eight minutes if anybody's got a question for alan please. harman yeah. dude i was thinking about you the other day bro don't think about harman dude i was man because he you know what he said the, uh on cornerism one time that he didn't think that rockets were going up that high that he thought it was about like 60 or 70 miles or something I think that too. I, I don't think, think it goes up. I don't even think he thinks all. that high. His, yeah, he I, thinks like sixty thousand feet. It, what, oh, oh, his was even lower. I think it was even lower. Oh, really? Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Hey, Harmon. Yes. Yeah. No. Uh, fifty thousand feet. Fifty thousand. Yeah. yeah. I have to. I have to re-examine. I'm not. I don't know if I'm prepared to go that low, but I am prepared to go hella low. Well, <laughs> and, and there's nothing again. to push off of at that height. Um, uh, yeah. No, I feel you. I'll go off that real quick. I was talking to um, uh, a guy who had a cargo, air cargo tr- transportation that he did, contract in the military, anything like that. He's 64, and I was talking to him the other day, and he owned his own Learjet for 25 years. And so I said, well, I says, I don't think anything can fly above 50,000 feet. He says, we flew at 51,000 feet all the time. I said, really? <laughs> 
And so he pulls up his phone, look it up, he's going to show me. Here's this pilot flying for 25 years. Oh, he says our manual says we can go up to 51,000. We fly at 41. Oh, snap. Yeah, this guy's, you know, that means how much they're just programming in, you know, just, yeah. just push it in. And so, nice. and so then he started thinking. And he says, well, when we get up higher, and this is what I got him thinking. I said, he says, well, when we get up higher, uh, the fuel is better. That's why they want us up higher. I said, well, why can't you go 51,000 feet? I said, you can't get up there. I said, well, he says, well, there's no resistance. I go, then how are you flying? He goes, what? I said, well, how do you take <laughs> off from the ground? Resistance. It's resistance. So how are you flying at 50, uh, 51,000 feet, which he wasn't 50, he's 41. How are you going to fly higher? How are you going to turn your plane? How are you going to do anything? The only thing I would say is that it's more dense because it's going to be, uh, it's really cold up there, like negative 67 okay. Fahrenheit. But I don't know. I still don't have enough air to. cannot hover above 10,000 feet. Correct. Why? Well, because the helicopter is literally pushing the air down underneath it, not across because its wings. air is not thick enough for it to go once it hits 10,000 feet. That's why they can't land on uh, Mount Everest or do like that. Now, they can, they got these super turbo helicopters and go up to 25,000 feet. Now, help me on this if I'm wrong on this like this. The one on so Mars can go. So, uh, so a helicopter cannot <laughs> hover over 10, and that's a super helicopter. Most helicopters can't go by 9,000 feet. Parachutes, from my study and all this stuff that came into being, parachutes usually don't open till 13,000 feet because the air is not thick enough for them to open. You know, there's a guy claiming he his opened at 18,000 feet. So I look in Bangladesh, I look in... Uh, the guy who did the Project Manhai, how when his parachutes open, that's why they do when they did that um, bomb gunner. Part of his thing he was doing to see how far the farthest free fall. He didn't even open his parachute till eight thousand feet. So you can't. There's military in the '60s took a jet and put a small jet inside the belly of it. They took a big jet up. Flew it up to 48,000 feet. And they got it on video doing this thing because the other ones were videoing it from below. And they dropped it out of the belly, hoping it could start up and it could get higher than 50,000 feet. So like Virgin Galactic says Well, this one, they actually did it. And then when it did it, the thing just corkscrewed out of this. There was nothing for it to grip on. Would it you just squ squirrel down? I don't know how, what happened at the end of it. Would you say that it's all, all, the Virgin Galactic is completely fake? They're, they're, you're not going past nothing. You can't push off anything. It's like swimming in an empty swimming pool. You can't swim. Mm -hmm. There's nothing to push off of. And I, I looked at all, and that's just, of course, my opinion, but that's from all the studies I learned through Project Manhai, Billy <laughs> Von Goner, uh, Joseph Kittinger, which is 93 years old, which is still alive, who was the one who set the record first in the 60s of going up. I think they, they would say that they're pushing off the air and then kind of launching into the no air. That's what they would say. But there's nothing to guide you. No, that's true. I mean, you have you can't go left, right. And I mean, it, and a lot of people says, oh, it just keeps guiding going up straight. Good Off luck. of what? Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Anybody yeah, else questions awesome. for? So what do you Ellen. think about that? Hey, what do you think, Ellen? Dude, I'm, I'm with you, bro. I didn't realize it was that low. Thank you. I'll have to re reconsider that. That's uh, the highest gonna... we've ever gone with a balloon is about 26 miles. Yeah. Which is 130, 128 to 130,000. Awesome, dude. Thank you for that. For some reason, I remembered, I, I remembered it differently. I thought you said 75 miles or something like that. No. Um, That's what, the yeah. reason it got me on this was, first they said the helicopter on Mars, which the atmosphere on Mars is supposed to be the same as us, is at 15 miles up, which you ain't got that, but that's a lie within itself. And But they had a helicopter flying on Mars. <laughs> yeah, dude, I know. That's my favorite. And it deployed a parachute and all this. They're like, so how so is crazy. a helicopter on Mars when the atmosphere... You can't. Ours can't go past 10,000 feet, but they're saying it can go to equivalent to 50. So they said, well, we put an extra rudder on it. Uh, rotate <laughs> yeah. It. And it yeah, took a picture, nuts. and it was perfectly picture of the uh, brother, of the blades. Impossible. Really Let's take, anyway, uh, that, I just go on and on. But I was asking about the ether real quick. That oh, was yeah. Go ahead. So you said the ether. Okay. And so the ether is different than the air. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Uh, it's just, you know, that's just where I, I get lost in that. Because I, I, in my opinion, of course, I, I'm not, I can't even begin to talk like you and 
and Austin and all those guys. The air and the ether to me are the same thing, same principles. And when it does the vortex, just like always pinch to keep it simple, the vortex well, is the is yeah, the they do. turning and charging. And part of the charging process is like the rivers. Rivers go through go through the river before man screwed them up. They had the natural vortex going down every river vortex. It's everything in the in the world is in a vortex. Liquids in it. You pee, it's in a vortex. Have you, you seen pop. Victor Schauberger's work with the, I, I, with the rivers? I've watched him. Uh, I'll do that. Yeah, dude, I'm so. just now diving into that. I found. Oh yeah, that's uh, right. Yeah, in nature and stuff like that, and the war, mm-hmm. river banks. Instead of being banks, yeah. it should be vortexed in, imploding yeah. instead of exploding. Stuff. So my theory yeah. is is just me just thinking, is how the charges, is part of the mountains and stuff, and the ranges are part of it. Is that when the wind goes through there, which I consider the ether, it charges up and goes through that, and that's part of the charging system. That's why out in the oceans you had the doldrums where it just sets dead, like dead water, dead air, out there between uh, Africa and South America, I think it is. It's called the doldrums. You've heard of that, yeah. right? Yeah. Yo, uh, real quick before we head off to the last person, can we take Chris real quick? He's got his hand up for a minute. Go ahead, Chris. Oh, yes. Thanks, bro. So I didn't mean to cut anybody off, but I just really wanted to really quick, you alluded to um, you know, the block domain wall. And I was wondering if you could kind of explain how the equipotential increase um, from the surface, like what does that tell us about the physical properties or attributes of the surface above us, um, a.k.a. the firmament? You know, like uh, would that would that also indicate, you know, the 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 block domain wall being kind of a, a flat plane? Would that also include the firmament? So as far as I can tell, like if that if that's where that diff, if that if that's where the. Uh... It would have to be flat, right? That uh, because of the the way it's distributed uh, linearly, equal potential, you know, across the plane, right? If it was, if we lived on a sphere, it would fall off at four over or r squared or whatever it is, or four pi r squared. So it, it doesn't fall off at that rate. So it's not it's not that. And if it was, if the surface was curved at the same distribution, there would be curvature within the field. Like you, you could measure it. It's not. So there there. Um, that uh, where it equals out at is a flat distribution, definitely. So a more opinion. accurate description of the firmament would be more of a flat surface than a dome, which is something I've heard Jaronism cover as well, right? Right. I mean, just kind of for as a generalization. Uh, for my interpretation, yeah. Interesting. Like, like, like there could like there could still be another structure or, or whatever, you know. Hypothetically, yeah, yeah. But, but yeah, my the my interpretation. Yeah, my interpretation based off of like w- within that gradient, that's has to be uh two surfaces that are like this and not not one that's like this. when you showed alan when you showed that uh video i think steve did it right steve did the modeling of the stars that you showed yeah yeah <clears throat> is that done with a flat plane of stars first or a dome of stars uh I th- i'm pretty sure it's a plane of stars and then the perspective is curved or whatever right. and then when he has the refre- uh atmospheric conditions that's when it even that's when it looks even more gives you like what we see much more of a dome yeah. shape okay got you all right well thanks alan that was awesome great yep. having you and uh we've got somebody coming up next <clears throat> i believe it is steven let me get him 